Mind, is this good? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, hello everybody and welcome to our panel for this afternoon. Uh, my name is Claire Croston and I am a uh, professor of history at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and it's my honor to chair this session today. And so um, I will be introducing our speakers uh, one by one. We have a big group today so they will each be uh, having a slightly shorter um, talk so that we can have lots of time for discussion at the end. So let's jump right in and begin with um, Jacob Mellish, who is Assistant Professor of History at the University of Northern Colorado, where he has been since 2011. Um, he received his PhD from the University of Michigan and also his DOA from the École des Études en Sciences Sociales in 1992. He's the author of numerous articles on 18th century Paris, um, focusing on the world of work, in particular the role of women in the workshop and relations between wives and husbands. Uh, his articles include The Power of Wives, Managing Money, and Men in the Family Business of Old Regime Paris, in a collection edited by and co-edited by another one of our panelists, Nina Kushner, um, along with Daryl Hafter. The collection was entitled Women and Work in 18th Century France. Uh, today, um, Jacob's talk is entitled, uh, he's switching us from the world of male to female violence. His talk is entitled, Gave a Large Number of Kicks and Punches, Women's Violence and the Responses to It in 17th Century Paris. I'd like to start by taking us to July 1670 when a woman by the name of La Musinaire, along with her grown daughter, angrily went to the home of a neighbor. Like around 80% of Parisians, the neighbor lived in one room, a rented lodging in a small tenement. At one point, the neighbor apparently protested about being aggressively approached in her own room. La Musinaire responded, quote, I'll make you eat your beautiful room, then metaphorically carried out her threat by taking one of her neighbor's light ceramic pots and smashing it over her neighbor's head. La Musinaire then allegedly, quote, gave a large number of kicks and punches to the woman. Historians of early modern Europe have used statistical and qualitative analyses to argue that violence by and usually between men was common and was usually for the defense of personal honor and interest. Indeed, until recently, the study of violence implicitly meant that by and between men. In the 80s and 90s, violence by women was occasionally mentioned, but dismissed as rare and, and, and insignificant. One historian in the field summarized the research of the time in 1997, quote, every quantitative study available tells us that women constituted a, quote, tiny minority of those prosecuted for violence. Another historian concluded that the evidence in the typical legal archive portrays women's, women's involvement in violence as, quote, minimal and mostly passive. We now have a different understanding. Manon van der Hagen has noted that violence by women is practically excluded from the better studied higher courts, but is far better documented in a few lower, court, lower courts that did not filter out as much uh, what they prosecuted. Due to their institutional characteristics, 17th and 18th century English court records have been particularly helpful here. Studies of London and of Portsmouth have found that despite institutional bias, women consistently made up over 30% of those prosecuted for violence. The same has been found for pre-Reformation Scottish towns. Women who used violence, both in Paris and in Britain, were not typical of other women accused of crime. They were not poor, mobile, and single. Rather, they were typical working women, fairly rooted, financially stable, and married. For example, La Musinaire and her husband ran a cobbler's shop. The woman she attacked with a, was a leather embroiderer in a putting out system and also married. Our answer to the key question, how violent were early modern women, has thus changed. Minimal and mostly passive, they were not. The study of early modern women's use of violence is important for several reasons. Indeed, so important that we often seem to be implicitly celebrating their violence. Their violence shows they did not conform to the image of weakness and passivity that was promoted so obsessively in some early modern and even modern male discourse. It renders unto early modern women a part of their humanity that has been invisible and it shows that women exercise coercion and domination, traits that men have often tried to associate only with themselves. It also shows that women were an integral part of a key aspect of early modern culture, its interpersonal violence. 
The records I used from a neighborhood legal official in late 17th century Paris cannot contribute to the statistics. My records are highly filtered. Violence by women was only recorded in a very limited range of circumstances, mostly if the person they attacked was pregnant or wealthy, or if one or more of the disputants' husbands was involved in the altercation as well. Due to that intense filtering, in several hundred cases of violence by men, there are only 22 by women. The high level of filtering suggests that the actual incidence of women's violence was significantly higher, as corroborated by the British historiography. Practically all of the women's violence took place in the street between two women. La Musinaire's case was atypical in terms of location, but I've chosen it as my narrative frame because occurring indoors it meant that there were more witnesses, making it better documented. Most fighting women here employed four techniques in various combinations, slapping, punching, kicking, and, quote, throwing themselves at their victim, which consisted of hurling all one's body weight at the target, knocking her and occasionally him to the ground. For partly institutional reasons, the court cases I use have written witness testimony that is, that is among the most lengthy and detailed for early modern Paris. One of the things they include, which is usually excluded or passed over summarily elsewhere, is descriptions of the reactions of bystanders, both women and men. That enables us to deepen our answer to the question, how violent were early modern women, by also looking at the other side of the coin, how women among the bystanders responded to that violence. In practically every instance of violence between women, on average, two to three women among the bystanders rapidly intervened to break it up. Men did not, except for husbands who were not always around during altercations. It's worth noting that women's intervention was not just limited to fights between those of their own gender. In practically every fight between men, women also intervened to stop an alter altercation, as I've examined elsewhere. For example, one neighbor testified that she verbally threatened to throw dirty water on La Musinaire. Another testified that she herself and her mother held La Musinaire back from continuing to attack their neighbor, and that they then joined an unspecified number of others to make La Musinaire and her daughter leave the building, which she said had been a difficult task. More generally, witness testimony describes women interveners as forcefully separating disputants, with the aggressor resisting, but not too much. There was, by contrast, a type of dispute in which women did not generally intervene when a local was attacking a stranger. Fighters themselves also chose to place limits on their violence. Women chose to break bones less than did men, and they chose to injure their, injure their victims in a way that proved fatal less often, although I'm frequently mortified at how, uh, how much violence a pregnant woman could be subjected to. We cannot, of course, paint all early modern working women with the same brush. Women had different attitudes toward violence. Some women actively rejected the use of violence, although they were a minority among the women prosecuted, among the women who prosecuted. The woman whom La Musinaire attacked chose not to respond violently. Indeed, she made a point of it in terms of how she verbally presented herself on the spot to her neighbors. All this work that women did against the violence around them, their intervening to break up violent altercations, is an area of the historiography from which they are mostly excluded. Statistical analyses have demonstrated to the satisfaction of most, at least at the moment, that violence declined dramatically during the early modern period. The explanations for the decline are multiple, but actual research tends to focus on the increasing power of the state with more abstract reference to increasingly complex social interdependence, which is harder to study. Women were, however, a key player in the control of violence. They provided rapid on-the-ground intervention that the state could not even dream of. In addition, it was usually w only women who provided verbal criticism of the violence, regardless of the gender of the fighters. This all suggests that women contributed significantly not only to the violence of early modern society, but also to keeping that violence in check, and that in the gradual decline of violence during the period, women played a key role. It is more difficult to get at working men's attitude toward the violence of the women around them. With rare exceptions, no man intervened in fights between women except for the occasional husband of a fighter. There is one man in my corpus who did explain why he did not intervene. He was a witness to La Musinaire altercation. 
His wife did not hesitate to intervene and testified as such. He, by contrast, testified that he did not act, explaining that he heard La Musnaire's victim shouting that she was being attacked with a staff, a thick walking cane that doubled as a club. Interestingly, neither the plaintiffs themselves nor any other witness mentioned any such shouts nor any use of a staff or other weapon, except for the aforementioned pot. This suggests that the man imaginatively invented the staff in order to justify why he did not intervene, for the staff made intervention unambiguously dangerous. His, in, his inaction and invention also suggests that he was afraid to intervene and that he took La Musinaire's violence serious, violence seriously. This implies that some men, at least, were intimidated by the violence of women. The attitude of magistrates and jurists towards women's violence is also hard to gauge, but there are a number of readily apparent reasons why women's violence was prosecuted so much less frequently. First, as noted, women often chose to inflict less physical damage than did many men. Second, the Parisian commi police commissioners seemed to require the consent of a married woman's husband before they would prosecute for violence. She may have been the plaintiff, but he was the demandeur ultimately in charge of the case. Most husbands evidently did not think it worth paying the legal fees unless they themselves had been involved. Finally, the state may have felt less threatened by women's violence since women's violence was not vaguely associated with violent insurrection the way men's violence ultimately was. The final topic I'd like to briefly note is that women's violence was not entered into casually. It had specific and serious motives. Most transcriptions of criminal cases concerning violence by either gender in early modern Paris avoid all reference to the cause of the altercation and focus only on the legally salient points, usually who threw the first blow. The violence thus appears as if it came out of nowhere, as if it were entered into casually with little or no cause. That was not the case in the corpus here. For example, the neighbor whom, which is more uh, documented in greater detail. For example, the neighbor whom La Musinaire attacked was attempting to have La Musinaire's daughter excluded from the leather embroidery trade because the daughter had allegedly violated the terms of her apprenticeship by leaving early to work for an embroiderer who would pay, pay her at the regular rate, thus depriving the neighbor of cheap labor to compensate for the time spent training her. The apprenticeship terms had not been notarized, notaries were expensive, and men excluded most women from the, from the majority of guilds that regulated such matters for men. To conclude, although women's uh, violence is only selectively documented, violence appears to be just as much a part of the culture of early modern women as it was of men. By including how women responded to the violence around them, I seek to avoid presenting women as dependent on an outside force, men, the state, other institutions run by males, to maintain order. In our answer to the question, how violent were early modern women, their use of violence was one side of the coin, their work against it the other. Thank you.